Hello everyone, welcome to What If Deku Joins Assassin's Creed Brotherhood Part 2. Before we start please go support Emmanuel Lucas 236 for writing that awesome fanfic, now let's begin. Memory 3. Assassin's Creed and the Animus. Abstergo Building. At the top of the well-known Abstergo Building, more precisely, in that room where the Grandmaster Templar was, he was looking at the news on the big screen in his room, where the news was commenting on the attack on Tartarus, and this made the man very serious. And angry. Grandmaster. I remember I was very clear with what I said. I said bring the boy over here and kill the assassins. He said it with a very serious tone and with a contained anger inside him. He was saying that to the communicator in his ear, and he knew the person on the other end of the line was listening. Grandmaster. It was a simple task. Bring the boy here and kill the damn assassins, how did you let that happen? You had a bucking job and you couldn't even bucking do it. W we didn't know the assassins would be able to get in. Grandmaster. Oh, didn't you know? Haha <laughs> we're talking about our enemies of several centuries and decades. Did you really think the assassins wouldn't do anything? He asked slightly irritated, barely able to contain his anger and frustration. Uh, sorry, Grandmaster. Grandmaster. Sigh I bet you don't want to see my face right now. Do something, look for Izuku Midoriya, and bring him here dead or alive, if need be, and it better not be the other option. Dot. Understood, Grandmaster it was the only thing the person said before hanging up. As for the said Grandmaster, he took his cell phone, dialed a number just before calling someone. And while waiting for the person to answer. Yes. Grandmaster. Have you seen the news, Overhaul? Overhaul. Yeah, I know. The assassins are more dangerous, even for prison in Tartarus. Did you just call me for that? Grandmaster. No, I just want to know how the goods are doing. He asked as he looked out the window at the city. Back to Izuku. 30 minutes passed when Izuku managed to escape from prison on account of the assassins, and also because of them the boy was also saved from his pursuers. And at this point, we can see that Sean parked the van in a spot after a big door closed just as the vehicle entered the place, and when that happened, Rebecca opened the back door of the van and said, Rebecca. We're here. You drove well, Sean she said while Washi, Sean and Izuku, even reluctantly, got out of the vehicle. Sean. Are you serious that you doubted my ability as a getaway pilot? He asked in a mocking tone, but even asking that, he knew what the answer would be. Rebecca. Do I really need to answer? Washi. Let's go inside. He said as he took the hood off his head to reveal his short brown hair. Izuku. Wait there everyone turned to Izuku and saw that he was serious and suspicious. You still owe me an explanation. What's going on? What do you want from me? Sean. Look, I know it's going to be hard for you to trust us, but we want to help you if you help us too. Izuku. What? Rebecca. What my idiot boyfriend means is. We'll explain everything to you and even help you, but first you'll have to come with us and trust us. She said while standing in front of Izuku. Izuku. Even though he didn't say anything, Izuku still remained suspicious, and they all noticed it. Washi. Also, we got you out of Tartarus. Sean. Forcibly. As he said that, Washi and Rebecca looked at him. Fake cough but still, we got you out of there. Washi. Do you have a better choice than to come with us and trust us, Midoriya? Izuku saw that he was right. Like it or not, they took Izuku out of Tartarus, one of the worst prisons in the world, and they still know the boy is innocent. Izuku saw no option but to accept. Entering deeper into the place, they saw an elevator, and as they entered it, all were taken upstairs. When the door opened, Izuku saw what appeared to be a hideout, with many men and women fiddling with computers, weapons, devices, or even eagles that appeared to be trained. Rebecca. Welcome to our hideout, Izuku. Listen, what place is this exactly? Sean. Ushi just mentioned that our hideout. Izuku. And no, what I mean is, where are you guys hiding exactly? He asked as he stopped walking. Right below my workplace. Hearing that voice, Izuku was wide-eyed as he recognized him. Turning around, Izuku saw. Izuku. Principal Nezu. Nezu. Hello, young Midoriya I'm glad you're okay. He said with his characteristic humor while next to him was that same 50-year-old man who spoke to Nezu hours ago. Washi. Greetings Mr. Nezu and Mr. William. He said while bowing a little to the two. William. You already know you don't need that, Washi. He said that with a smile a little before looking at Izuku. Nice to meet you, Izuku Midoriya my name is William Miles. Nezu already commented on you. Izuku. What? No, wait a minute he said while keeping his hands on his head. There's so much going on in one day that I think I'm going to start having a headache. Can someone please explain to me what's going on? William. First, of course, we'll explain everything to you. And second, take it easy, young man. I know it's crazy but... Izuku. No, no, no. 
This is more than crazy for me, this is very serious crazy thing first I'm framed, then I'm rescued in an escape in Tartarus, I almost got killed, I'm in a place I didn't even know existed, and now I find out that my headmaster is part of this assassin's order. He said everything in disbelief and almost in disbelief. Nezu. I know it's unbelievable to believe, but everything has an explanation. He said as he and William showed a way to Izuku, who followed them along with Rebecca, Sean and Washi. We are more than an order, we are a brotherhood. Izuku. Brotherhood. Is it like a family or something? He asked confused. Sean. Hey <laughs> yeah, I almost thought the same thing when I first walked in, but it's more than that. Here's our creed. We take an oath to be part of this order that tries to fight for freedom and peace against the our enemies, the Templars. Izuku. And you guys do that by killing people. He asked as everyone entered a room, which had computers, monitors and some kind of comfort chair in the middle of the room. Rebecca. We do kill people, but we don't kill innocent people. That's part of the dogma of our creed, which is. To take our blade away from the flesh of the innocents. She said a little before sitting in a chair while Sean sat in another chair while Washi was just watching nearby. Izuku. But what about Stain the hero killer? In the prison, I saw that you and he seemed to know each other, and as far as I know, Stain killed a lot of heroes he said while looking at Washi. William. Stain was part of our creed, and he contributed what he could, but then he started to go off the rails. He said seriously while Rebecca and Sean fiddled with the computers. Izuku. What do you mean? Nezu. Understand one thing, young Midoriya. As much as most of the heroes that Stain killed are not innocent and have some connection with the Templars, he started to have a new belief in his head. Using his abilities and as our order taught them, Stain began to kill any hero he thought were fake, and because of that, Stain wasn't following our orders and doing everything according to what he believed in. He almost compromised the order of assassins for that. He said while remembering how Stain acted before and after he entered the assassin order just before remembering the news that where Stain killed his victims according to his belief. Washi. That's until you show up, Midoriya. His comment made Izuku look at the man. After you defeated Stain and when he was taken to Tartarus, I and some assassins infiltrated there precisely because of him initially. Izuku. To rescue him? William. No, to ensure he never runs away again or commits no more murders using our abilities. Washi. I could even kill him if they gave me the order. But all our plans changed as soon as you were sent to Tartarus. His words made Izuku curious. Nezu. We've had our eyes on you for a long time, young Midoriya, including the Templars. Izuku. Watching me. But but why? Sean. In short, young man, we all want to see your past. More precisely, your ancestor. Izuku. Seeing my ancestor. Wait a minute, what's this talk about seeing my ancestor? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I don't have a quirk that allows you to see my past or ancestor, as you're saying. Rebecca. We don't need it, we have that. She said as she pointed to that chair in the middle of the room, which had a machine shape, and that was not at all common. Rebecca. This is the Animus. My Animus, a 3.0 version that I created myself. Izuku. Oh what is this Animus? He said while looking at that chair while analyzing. Sean. In short, this is a virtual reality machine that allows you to see your ancestors' memories, but for that to work, the Animus needs your DNA. He said while looking briefly at Izuku a little before going back to messing with what he was messing with on the computer. Izuku. My DNA. You mean this here will take my blood? He asked taking a step back while pointing to the animus. Rebecca. Relax, this is safe. Of course, there are the issues of the bleeding effect that only happens from being in the animus for a long time, but you'll be fine. A friend of ours has already used this to prove it safe. By mentioning this friend, we can see that William's look showed sadness. Izuku. But even so, how exactly does that work? Better yet, what do you want with my ancestor? Who are these Templars and who exactly are the assassins? Hearing that question, Rebecca and Sean looked at each other as they stopped fiddling with the monitor for a while. Sean. Do we show him? Rebecca. Well. William. Show to him when they heard that, everyone looked at William. The boy deserves to see and know how it works. You can show him. Upon hearing William's orders, the couple looked at each other and nodded as Sean played some sort of recording on the large monitor in front of everyone present in the room, and the large screen began showing a city a city of Jerusalem in 1191. Izuku. Is this a movie? Rebecca. No this is a demonstration of what the Animus showed us. What you're seeing, Midoriya, is something real that happened many years ago. His words left Izuku shocked, surprised and intrigued, and of course, he wasted no time and continued watching. The recording continued showing the city, and in the middle of it, Izuku saw a square where many people were around were seeing a hanging, where the sentenced people were already dead. And before Izuku was shocked or commented anything, on top of a church with a bell, an eagle flew by, and in it appeared a man with a white cloak and a hood on his head, and he was watching the one on top of that church. 
More precisely, he was looking at the Templar guard who was standing in the middle of the stage where this execution was taking place. Rebecca. This was Alter Ibn Lahid, an assassin who lived through the Crusades, and one of our friend's ancestors who used the Animus. She said in a serious tone while the screen showed the said altar disappearing from the top of the church, to then show him in the midst of people who watched the hanging. Izuku. The time of the Crusades was in the 12th century, wasn't it? So what we're seeing now is he said almost in disbelief. Sean. It's a little thing that Alter saw in the year 1191. As they talked, Izuku saw Alter pass by all those people as he got closer to the three guards that were causing that force. Alter killed a guard by shooting him with a crossbow that was on Alter's back, knocked a guard to the ground who tried to attack the assassin, and then used his body to make a great leap towards the Templar guard who tried to take his hand. Sword to defend himself, but it was too late. Alter, who had a hidden blade in his left arm, killed the guard by slamming the blade into his neck as the assassin fell off the man who died instantly. Izuku upon seeing this was shocked as Alter looked back just before running away from a guard who tried to attack him but failed to hit the assassin who managed to flee. Izuku. This man Alter was he the only ancestor of your friend that you saw through the Animus? William. No, he's got a lot more than you think. Nezu. Rebecca. Sean. Could you show young Midoriya more? Sean. No problem. They said as we see Alter jump and climb the roofs of the houses and buildings that existed at the time as the guards tried to chase the assassin who jumped off one of the guards but did not kill him. It looked like Alter was surrounded by him standing in front of a church door while four guards stood there looking at the assassin who showed no fear or concern. And when the church bell rang and many hooded people came out of the church that Alter was in front of, the assassin used that opportunity to disappear, which not only left the guards confused but Izuku as well. The next recording showed an elderly man who appeared to be 50 years old, wearing a grayish black robe, and the recording showed him lying on the ground just before two guards appeared and dragged him somewhere, and this elderly man did not look want to attack or fight back. Rebecca. This was Ezio Auditor Da Firenze, the assassin who contributed most to the assassin order. Sean. In addition to being one of the most respected, it's no wonder he became a mentor. Izuku. From the name I assume he was Italian. He said while watching Ezio being dragged through some kind of fortress with many guards looking at Ezio and ensuring he doesn't run away or think about running away. When is this happening? Nezu. 1511, a time when there was a dispute between the Ottomans and the Byzantines, and mentor Ezio Auditor found himself in the middle of this dispute as he searched for answers. As they talked, Izuku saw Ezio at the top of the tower, with several guards around him armed with glaives and swords that were pointed at Ezio, who was walking with bound hands towards a wooden plank as he was pushed by a Templar guard. Who was holding a rope. Izuku. Wait a minute, are we seeing the moment he's going to die? Rebecca. We thought the same thing at first, but it doesn't matter what situation Ezio found himself in, she said as the recording showed the guard taking the hood off Ezio's head, who was very calm even with a rope being placed on his neck. He always found a way to escape. As she said that, Izuku saw Ezio elbow the man in the head, who was stunned as Ezio took this opportunity and grabbed the rest of the rope he was going to be struggling with. Before that man or the guards could even do anything, Ezio threw that rope around the man's back neck and threw himself onto the plank, causing the man to lie flat on his stomach on that wooden plank. The guards tried to do something, but Ezio, who was holding onto the rope so he wouldn't hang himself or break his neck, managed to free himself from the knot that was around his neck, fell further down, but, unbelievably, Ezio landed in a spot. Not so low of the tower, thus surviving. Seeing that he had managed to get away, Ezio stood up, put his hood back over his head, and walked somewhere. And that little demonstration about Ezio Auditor left Izuku open-mouthed. Izuku was impressed that that 50-year-old man managed to escape from a gallows risking himself but still fighting and surviving, all without using a power. Then the couple showed another recorded memory, and this time, Izuku saw a field where war was going on, with many soldiers, guns and cannons fired, and many men wounded or killed. But before Izuku could ask anything, an eagle that was watching that war flew between the trees and in the middle of them, a man jumped from there to fall among the men who were losing the battle. William. That was the last one we saw with Desmond's DNA, his name was Raton Nicton, but he was better known as Connor Kenway, the master assassin of the Colonial Brotherhood. Izuku. From the name I believe he came from an Indian tribe if I'm not wrong. He said while continuing to look at that recording. Does this take place in the American Revolutionary War? Izuku asked this because of the flags, clothes and weapons that that recording showed, not to mention that Izuku has already studied the subject. Nezu. Yes, but Master Connor only wanted one thing, save his people. Izuku. And he made it. Izuku asked curiously. Rebecca. In a way yes, but the journey to that was high. As they talked, Izuku saw Connor grab a horse and run towards the enemies, who saw the assassin advance towards him and shot him, but Connor was not hit, but the horse was. 
continuing on foot, Connor ran towards them, but first he took cover from the shots through a large boulder that was on that battlefield. Seeing that Connor was still fearlessly heading towards the Redcoats, they tried to reload their weapons to shoot Connor, but it was too late Connor had already arrived towards them. The Redcoat tried to shoot the assassin, but he caused the gun butt to hit the guard's chin through the shot, but Connor didn't stop there. He took that weapon and hit the face of another enemy that was going to attack him, just before Connor advanced further in as the men Connor was helping watched everything from a distance and would use this opportunity to attack. As for Connor, who killed a guard using his own gun with one shot, grabbed the other guard and used him as a human shield to protect himself from the shots being aimed at the assassin, who managed to protect himself using his enemy body. Izuku. He looks like a fighting machine he thought with his mouth open. Still advancing, Connor picked up a tomahawk that had a shape of the assassin symbol on the tip of the hatchet in one hand, while in the other hand he carried a knife in the other, and using these two weapons, Connor counterattacked and killed whoever attacked him in his path, like now where Izuku saw the Indian assassin slash a man's throat with a knife, take a man down with a tomahawk, and cut the leg of another red coat that tried to attack Connor. As for, let's say, Connor's allies, they fire cannons while other men advance towards the enemies, not only to help Connor, but also to finish off the Redcoats, who were slowly dying, not only from Connor, but from the cannon fire. As for the assassin, he saw a man on horseback in the midst of the Redcoats, he stared at him just before Connor advanced towards the man, who tried to order his men to go towards the assassin, but to no avail, Connor took a bow and arrow and shot the man in the shoulder, knocking him off his horse. William. Master Connor could even be considered impulsive or even naive, but one thing we can't deny William's words made Izuku look at him. He raised the assassins in the darkest time they ever lived, and we are very grateful to him. As he spoke, Connor had reached his target which was a Templar that he fired that arrow and killed him by hitting his Tamanhink in his chest. Izuku? Were these three men the only major contributors to your order? Sean? No, there's a lot more. He said while showing several memories at the same time with several different assassins, not only in terms of identity, but time as well. I managed to hack the Abstergo system along with other assassins, and we managed to recover several memories of several assassins in our order. Rebecca. Like that guy for example, that one over there is Edward Kenway. She said while pointing to a memory where we see the man known as Edward, who wore a hooded and leather pirate outfit, participating in a tavern brawl while killing a man in Spanish dress just before taking a bag of money that was with him. Izuku. Kenway. Was he related to Connor? Nezu. You're paying attention, that's great he was Master Connor's grandfather. Before he was just a pirate who wanted his fortune, but then he joined the order and became a respectable assassin. Nezu was happy with Izuku's question, which proves that the boy is interested in knowing more. As they talked, Izuku saw Edward and his tribulation break into an English ship, with Edward killing several men without much difficulty, killing them with shots, with the hidden blades or even with one of his two swords that were on Edward's waist, who was fighting an English captain, and it looked like the pirate was at a disadvantage, but when the English advanced towards Kenway, he dodged and caused the captain to fall and get his head stuck in the ship's helm. But before he could try to flee, Edward swung the ship's wheel and killed the English captain mercilessly in the process, and that shocked Izuku as he took small steps back. But it didn't stop there, the screen also showed other assassins who lived in different historical times, such as the French Revolution where the assassin Arnaud Dorian, who sought revenge for the death of his adoptive father. Assassin who was killing several guards inside a fortress in Paris in 1789, along with an angry population and some of the Assassin Brotherhood, helping him in the middle against soldiers on the ground or at the windows of the fortress. Izuku. You mean that all this time all these years he said shocked as he saw all those memories, including the time of the Industrial Revolution in London, where the Assassins Jacob and Evie Fry fraud against the local government. Bringing gangs together and freeing London from the inequality that existed at the time. Izuku that order existed among us. He asked shocked as the screen also showed the main creators of the assassin order, the time of Egypt where Bayek along with his wife Aya, worked together to protect the people of the Ptolemaic kingdom. Nezu. It existed even before Christ. Many don't know about the assassins and Templars, and they don't know about the war we've been fighting all this time in secret. Izuku. I don't understand his comment made everyone look at Izuku, who seemed to be in disbelief. I don't understand what do I have to do with this. Why am I suddenly in the middle of all this? because your ancestor has the answer the Templars want. Izuku upon hearing that voice, was left with wide eyes as he felt himself freeze to know who said that. But to be sure, Izuku slowly turned around to look at the person who spoke and to his surprise the person he thought wasn't there was right there. Izuku. And mom? He asked with wide eyes. Inko, who entered the room along with Kaina, who accompanied Izuku's mother along with the eagle that was on Lady Nagan's arm, looked at Izuku with a serious and sad look. Inko. I believe I owe you some explanation, my baby boy. She said just before that eagle let out its sound. 
End of soundtrack. Class 1 at dorm. Due to what happened today, classes were cancelled for today, which could be a reason for students to relax, but that was not what they wanted, especially now with the new news that everyone was now seeing on the television in the room. Of the one at dorm. And the news said. We recently received reports that the most dangerous prison in all of Japan, Tartarus, was attacked and invaded by unknown people. The police thought they were villains, but according to the recordings and the testimony of some guards, they are not sure who were exactly those people. Said a presenter while in the background he showed some photos and recordings of Tartarus, where he could see various damages such as gunshots and explosions. According to the guards, the group that broke into the Tartarus prison did not kill the guards, but the same thing cannot be said for some criminals who were killed while trying to escape from the prison. But one thing that is intriguing is that in one of these recordings, we can see that Izuku Midoriya, known as the UA. Trader was taken away and taken hostage by this unknown group who managed to escape with the prisoner. Said a reporter while showing on the screen some images and videos where we see Izuku with that bag on his head just before being thrown into the van. As the report continued, the students who were watching it were speechless and even shocked to see it, while Lichako kept her hands over her mouth, fearing that something terrible had happened to Izuku. She just didn't cry because she was hoping that somehow the green-haired boy was okay. But what she wanted to know is where is he? Not wanting to see that news anymore, the girl got up from the couch and decided to walk to her room. Sayu. Echako. Denya. Yuraka, where are you going he said while trying to get closer to her, but. Echako. I want to be alone so don't follow me, all of you. She said in a serious tone before walking away from everyone, but without looking at Bakugu with a cold look, which the blonde also did. Momo. We better give her a break. She said worriedly. Siro. Who do you think these people are? Mineta. Maybe they're a new group of villains maybe they went to rescue Midoriya from Tartarus. Haminari. Do you still think Midoriya is a traitor? Mineta. After this news, my suspicions that Midoriya is a traitor only increased. Hiroshima. I don't know, guys. I'm sensing something is wrong. Hayoka. Do you think Midoriya is okay? Shoto. I just hope so. Mina. I hope the police and the heroes find them. Bakugu. As for Bakugu, he was sitting at the table, but he could still hear very well what everyone is talking about. A part of him didn't care about Deku, but the other part of him was curious to know. Where did you go, you bucking nerd? He asked this in a whisper. As for Ichako, she had arrived in her room and as she closed the door, she leaned the wall against the door as she crawled to the floor as she clasped her hands as if she was praying. Ichako. Please, be well, Izuku. Back to Izuku. Back at the assassin's hideout, we see that Izuku was sitting in that chair, but without activating the animus while he was and reasoning out everything Inko had just said to him. Izuku who had his hands in a triangle shape close to his face, took a deep breath and said, Izuku. You mean that in all these years you were part of this order? He asked without even looking at Inko. Inko. I stopped acting after I had you, and the assassin order understood my side. Izuku. But what about my father? H. He was also of the assassin's creed. Inko. No, but he knew I was part of that order, and he accepted me anyway. Izuku. Why didn't you tell me anything? Why didn't you tell me anything about all this? The creed the Templars. He asked pleading for answers while looking at Inko. He's not angry but he wants to know. Inko. I wanted to spare you from this world I lived in. I knew it would be hard, but I wanted to spare you something that has nothing to do with you. She said as she placed her hand on her son's cheek. You wanted to be a hero and I I didn't want to ruin your dream. I thought that if I conquered your dream maybe. Maybe you would get rid of this fight between the assassins against the Templars. Dot but I was wrong. She said that last part with a serious look. Izuku. Do they want to see my past? My ancestor? He asked with a serious look. William. Here in Japan there is one thing they want, and that thing can only be found through the memories of their ancestor, young Midoriya. Nezu. We kept an eye on you in order to protect you against the Templars, but we failed, and now they know of your connection to this ancestor who hid a powerful artifact around here. Izuku was thoughtful, looked at the animus and asked, Izuku. If I enter here in this animus can we have the answers? His question took everyone by surprise. Sean. Yes, entering the Animus will give you access to the memories of your ancestor, who knows where something the Templars want is, and only you will be able to access those memories. He informed while Izuku continued looking at the Animus. Inko. Son, you're not thinking about. Izuku. Two minutes. He said while looking at Rebecca and Sean. I let you access these memories for two minutes to I see how it works, and if it's safe. Rebecca. Okay, it's understandable. Rebecca and Sean understood Izuku's side. Sean. Your body, your rules young man just sit there while we do the rest of the work. Hearing this, Izuku sat up and before he could get comfortable. Inko. Son, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Izuku. It's okay, mom. 
I just want to see how it works. Besides I also want to know more about myself and my past. He said that last part with a serious look. William. Kaina, adjust the animus for Midoriya. Kaina. Sure. Kaina, also known as Lady Nagant, approached Izuku and attached the animus equipment to Izuku's right arm, while she made the boy keep his head down, so that his head was connected by several wires. Izuku. This won't hurt, right? Kaina. I trust them, and if I were you, I would too. She said while holding Izuku's shoulder before moving away and staying by Inko's side, who was still worried. Rebecca. Are you ready, Midoriya? She asked if she turned the greenish one, who took a breath and asked, Izuku. Before I can know who I'm going to see. Nezu. Hiro Ishimaru, the assassin of the Assassin Order of Japan. Hearing that name, Izuku took a deep breath and nodded, thus giving the go-ahead for Rebecca and Sean to turn on the animus, and so they did. And when they turned on the animus, Izuku had the pupils of his eyes dilated as he felt his consciousness being taken to another place, this was a sign that the animus was working. End of soundtrack, Izuku, who had his eyes closed, opened them and saw that he wasn't in the same place where he was before. The place he was standing in looked like a white room that had nothing but him there. Izuku. And now what? As soon as he said that, everything started to change shape around Izuku, who stood still as he watched everything change. Just now he found himself in the middle of a battlefield in the middle of forests and mountains with many corpses there. Corpses of men in feudal armor like samurai as he looked around with a look of shock, not only for the corpses, but for their clothes and the place where he was, which seemed to be a mortal battle. Who are you? Izuku looked back and saw that whoever said that was a man in armor, and he wasn't talking to Izuku, but to a boy who appears to be six years old. The boy was serious, dirty and showed no fear even with that man looking at him. Aren't you going to say anything, little man? Come on, tell me your name and what are you doing here? I have no name and I am here to die. Said the boy as he looked down as he got on his knees, expecting to be killed by the man in front of him, even more because he was carrying a sword, but. You didn't have a name he said while kneeling in front of the six-year-old boy who looked at him. From now on, your name will be Hero. He said as he placed his hand on the newly baptized shoulder Hero, who was surprised by what he heard. Hero. What do you want? He asked curiously. Come on, let's get out of here. He said as he got up and walked among the corpses, while Izuku and Hiro, looking forward, saw a horse and what seemed to be the army of the man that was walking towards them. Rebecca. Sean, it's been two minutes, Sean. Okay, let's bring him back. Izuku heard Rebecca and Sean's voices, but before he could speak or question anything, Izuku felt his consciousness shift as everything around him crumbled away. And upon opening his eyes, Izuku found himself in the same room where Nezu, Inko, William and the assassins were while the green one sat while he didn't show any reaction. Nezu. Is he okay? Sean. I think so, we didn't do anything that we've never done before. He said as he and Rebecca approached Izuku. Inko. Son, are you okay? Izuku who had his head down, slowly raised his head as he looked at them with a look that he was surprised. Izuku. What was that I just saw? Memory 4. It's not what it seems. The next day, time. 8.10 a.m., the day has passed since the assassins took Izuku out of Tartarus. The police were left investigating and looking for any sign of Izuku and the assassins. But it was not just that. Recapping yesterday's events. A student known as Izuku Midoriya was declared a traitor to UA when a video that was broadcast on city screens showed the boy handing over important files to the villains. And so he was taken to Tartarus, from suddenly the prison was attacked by an unknown group who not only took Midoriya hostage, but also killed some of the inmates who were there. However, the guards remain alive. Said a presenter on the city screen with some people watching and others still walking. And still talking about yesterday, the former number one hero, All Might, alerted the police that Detective Tsukauchi Namasa had his house invaded and his whereabouts are unknown. The unanswered question is. What is happening to Japan? The presenter asked curious but worried. Focusing now elsewhere, we see that Izuku was standing with his eyes closed, but when he opened them, he saw that he was in a dark place with someone in front of him. He was a man in somewhat feudal attire and with a hood over his head, which was lowered. Izuku. Hello. That man didn't say anything, he just revealed that his wrists had two hidden blades, which surprised Izuku. But what scared the boy was when the man started to take steps towards him with those blades showing. Izuku. Hey wait, what are you doing? He continued walking towards Izuku with hidden blades exposed. Izuku. What are you doing? Get away from me he shouted as he tried to pull away, but his body wouldn't allow it. This is your destiny he said as he finally raised his head and looked at Izuku, but before the boy could see his face, the man quickly placed his hand on his face. Wake up, end of soundtrack, suddenly, Izuku woke up and saw that he was lying on a couch in that same room where that animus was, but Rebecca and Sean weren't around. Nightmares. 
Hearing that voice, Izuku turned around and saw that the one there was the well-known Lady Nagant, with the real name of Kaina. She was sitting on a chair while watching Izuku. Izuku? Something like that, and honestly, I was hoping that everything that happened yesterday was just a nightmare, and that in reality everything was just like before. He said as he sat down. You are Lady Nagant, right? Kaina? I was Lady Nagant, but now I'm someone else, or just Kaina. Izuku? If I may ask what are you doing here? Kaina? I was told to keep an eye on you until you wake up. And since you woke up, I believe you must be hungry. She said as she got up from her chair. Izuku? Yeah I believe so. Kaina? Okay, but first wear these clothes as soon as you take a shower. She said while pointing to some folded clothes that were on the floor next to the sofa. And the bathroom is over there, so feel free to wash up and change your clothes. As she said that, the former heroine turned to leave, but, Izuku? Wait a minute can I ask you a few questions? Kaina? I'm listening. She said as she turned around and looked at the greenish one. Izuku? Is my mother still here? Kaina? No, she went out to get your other clothes since you yeah, you already know. She said while pointing to the detainee outfit that Izuku was wearing. She suspects that you will have to stay here for a long time until your innocence is proven. Izuku? It was what I feared he said while scratching his head. Kaina? And what was the other question you have? Izuku? Why did you join this order of assassins? Kaina? May I know the reason for this question? She asked curious why he wanted to know that. Izuku? I'm just curious. Kaina? Let's just say I discovered the truth and thanks to the assassins, I was able to open my eyes and fight for a cause. She said with a serious look. Izuku? The truth? What do you mean by that? Kaina? The hard truths about so much of this world maybe one day you'll find out. Was the only thing she said as she turned around and left the room. I'll be waiting for you as soon as you finish. Once she left, Izuku looked at the other clothes as he picked them up in his hands. But before going to the place where he could wash and change clothes, Izuku stopped walking when he faced that animus he used the day before. Flashback, going back to the day before. Right when Izuku left the animus, we see that Sean offered the boy a bottle of water, which he accepted. And after hydrating himself a little, Izuku looked at Rebecca and Sean and asked, Izuku? What was that? Rebecca? That was a little memory of your ancestor when he was a kid. Hero. Izuku. And what I saw in this animus felt so. Sean. Real. That was real in a way. Everything you saw in those two minutes was not just a simulation, but a simulation of a reality that happened many years ago and that only the animus can show. He said while pointing to the animus. Izuku. So that's why the Templars are after me. Do they want me to get the answers for them? William. They want you to relive Hero's memories, and by reliving those memories, they'll get more information until they get to what they want. Hearing that, Izuku looked at the screen and asked. Izuku. How did they find me? Nezu. I believe that, like us, they were also watching you, and I believe that they were waiting for the right moment to catch up with you. Izuku. And what would happen to me after they got what they wanted? Inko. I don't know, and I'd rather not think about it. Izuku. Sigh I'm tired I think I need to rest after all this he said while he had his hand on his face. He didn't show to be tired physically, but mentally. Inko. Of course come with me son, I will take you to a place where you can lie down. She said as she got up and guided Izuku to a place where he could rest and sleep. As for the rest of those left in the room, they just watched the mother and son walk away. Sean. Do you think he'll want to enter the animus again? He asked as he and Rebecca walked to the computers, thus moving away from the grup. Rebecca. It's up to him, we can't force him into something he can't want, as much as we need the answers. Willem. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. He said while looking at Nezu. Nezu. Yes, the next few days are going to be hectic. He said as he and the rest of the group left the room, but before Kaina looked at Izuku, who was sitting on the couch, before leaving. Focusing a little on Izuku and Inko, who was about to leave, the boy asked a question. Izuku. Mom what will happen from now on? Inko. I don't know. Her answer made Izuku become crestfallen. But we will try to find a way. We'll find a way to prove your innocence. Until then, stay here and rest. She said with a gentle smile before walking away. As for Izuku, he just sat on that couch, which was comfortable as he watched Sean and Rebecca looking at the screen which Izuku ended up seeing when he entered the animus. But he was too tired to ask or do anything now, all he wanted right now was to lie down and cool off. And it wasn't long before he closed his eyes and fell asleep. End of flashback, back where we left off, Izuku was watching that animus before going into the bathroom to take a shower before eating. But first, he looked once more at that machine and asked himself, Izuku, what else can you show me? End of soundtrack, 1, a dorm, in the common room, we see that the one of students were there eating breakfast in total silence, kind of uncomfortable silence, and they knew it. But someone broke the silence of the place when they noticed something. Toru. 
Where's Achako? Hiroshima. I think she's still in her room. I didn't see her leave there. Siro. Maybe she's still worried about Midoriya. Hayoka. Or upset with some of us. She said as she continued eating. Sado. But isn't she coming down to eat? He asked while pointing to a plate they made for her. Denya. I think someone better bring her this to eat. Maybe I should. Sai. I'll take it to her. She said as she got up. Denya. Are you sure? He asked as he watched Sai pick up the plate. Sai. Yes, then you don't need to follow me. Was the only thing she said before walking away from everyone. As soon as she walked away, Sai went up to the floor where the girl was, and when walking and arriving at Achako's door, Sai knocked on the door. Sai. Achako, it's me. Sai. Initially there was only silence for exactly five seconds, but before Sai could call out to the girl again, Achako opened the door. She was wearing her usual clothes, but she didn't have her usual good-natured face. Achako, yes Tsu. Sai. You didn't come down to eat so I brought you your breakfast. You need to eat Kiro. She kindly offered the dish to Achako, who kindly accepted. Achako, thanks Tsu. I'll go down later to return the plate. She said with a slight smile as she was going to close the door, but Tsai stopped her. Tsai. You don't feel like talking. She asked worriedly. Achako. Tsai. I know you're worried about Midoriya. Achako. Since yesterday I haven't stopped worrying about him. My fear is what will happen to him. That's not even the worst part, many people believe he is a villain when he is not. Sai. Are you so sure about this? She asked with her hand on her chin. Achako. Yes, because I know who he is we've all seen what he's done and what he's willing to do. And what bothers me the most is that because of a video, everyone thinks he's a villain she said upset and sad. Sai. Not everyone. Her comment made Achako look at her. As much as that video was strange, I have my doubts that he is the traitor. I may not know Midoriya as well compared to you, but know that you are not the only one who believes in his innocence. Kiro I'm not just referring to myself, but other of our classmates also believe. She said with a smile. Achako. At least some believe but even so, I'm worried about him. She said with her head down. What if that group of hooded people are torturing him? What if they're from the League of Villains who came too? Sai. Achako she said while placing her two hands on her friend's shoulder. Hey, I know the situation is already bad, but thinking about the negative is not going to help us. Achako. You're right I just hope he's okay. She said while looking at her room and looking at something Izuku gave her. One of her personalized All Might shirts. Assassin's hideout. As soon as Izuku showered and changed his clothes, kinda guided him to a place where he could eat and on the way, there were other people who were doing their duties in the place, and some didn't stop looking at Izuku. Izuku. Was this place right under the UA all this time? He asked incredulously as he looked at the place where many assassins were passing by. Haina. Yes. Izuku. How long has this been? Haina. Since Nezu was rescued by the assassins. Her answer made Izuku stop walking and look at the woman. That was a long time ago, way before I joined the assassins creed. Weren't you hungry? She asked while showing the place in the hiding place where there were other assassins, men and women, feeding. I believe you will be able to manage very well without me. Have a good appetite it was the only thing she said before walking away, thus leaving Izuku alone. Seeing that he was alone, Izuku walked to the queue, which only had one person in front of him, and when that person was answered, it's Izuku's turn. Izuku. Excuse me. Ah, you must be Inko's son. What do you want to eat? Izuku was going to say something, but the man interrupted him. And before you ask, we don't have Katsudan. I'm sorry, young man. Izuku. Oh then I'll want a uh. I recommend you the chicken. Izuku heard a man's voice behind him, and when he turned around, he saw a man with an assassin outfit, and he looked to be over 40 years old. As much as I like steak. Izuku. I'll have the chicken, please. He said to the canteen attendant, who nodded. The chicken for Inko's son he said as he turned around, but hearing that, Izuku had a question in mind. Izuku. Is my mother that well known? A little while later, we see that Izuku was sitting alone at one of the tables eating his plate of food, and before that he continued eating. Can I sit with you? That man from before appeared next to Izuku, with a plate of food in his hands. Izuku. Of course, feel free. As he said that, the man sat next to Izuku while he started to eat the steak that was on his plate. My name is. Izuku Midoriya. I'm not the only one who knows, no wonder people are watching you here. He said as he noticed the assassins looking at Izuku, and each one of them was curious. Nice to meet you, I'm Callum Lynch, but you can call me Cal if you prefer. Izuku. Sure he said as he continued eating, but he kept looking at all those people in the place, and Cal noticed that. Pal. You seem nervous. Izuku. Worse than that I'm lost. Pal. Yeah, I heard about your situation. The Templars are complicated, even more so when they want you to enter the Animus for them. Izuku. Have you been through this? 
pal. Yes, and I must say you're lucky. Izuku was confused. I would much rather enter the animus that you entered than the animus that I entered. Izuku? Are there other types of animus? You accessed one of those machines. He asked surprised and curious. Pal. And I accessed the worst. That damn machine hurt the Templars wanted me to relive the memories of the ancestor, Aguilar, but in the end me and a small group of assassins managed to escape of Abstergo, and together we made it take what doesn't belong to them. It's a long boring story, so you won't want to know. He said while cutting and eating more of his food, and Izuku was doing the same thing, but he couldn't help but listen and become more curious. Izuku? Wait did you say Abstergo? Izuku was shocked by what he heard. The people Abstergo are the Templars, pal. And as you can imagine, these bastards are many. It may seem like a lot of people here, but compared to the Templars, we are very few. And yet here we are, fighting. And it looks like you entered the same boat as us I feel sorry for you. Izuku? Can I ask you a question? Pal. You're already making one, but feel free. He said as he continued eating. Izuku? I know that assassins and Templars have been killing each other for centuries, including before Christ, but did one of you or one of the Templars ever think about the possibility of being in peace and ending all this killing? Hearing that question, Cal stopped cutting his food and looked at Izuku, who was waiting for his answer. And from what the boy could see in Cal's eyes he was disappointed. Pal. Some have tried many times. Assassins like Connor Kenway have tried. Arno Dorian has tried and so have I, but in the end the result is still the same. Killing. There's no such thing of assassins and Templars stay in peace and suddenly stop killing each other. Regardless of whether you are an assassin or a Templar, there will always be someone who will not want that. But you want some advice, young man. If you are going to enter this war of ours, then you better be prepared because there are going to be times when you have to take the blade off your wrist and kill your enemy. Izuku. Pal. I'm sorry young man, but that's the reality. He said as he got up. And if I were you I would open my eyes now. It was the only thing he said before walking away, while well, Izuku was speechless with everything he just heard. Izuku? Kill. So not a possibility for all this to end. Does that mean that they will all die just by killing each other? How long will this last? How long will I have to stay here? He thought worried, nervous and terrified, but before he could think more. Nezu? Hello, young Midoriya. End of soundtrack. Hearing that voice, Izuku looked to the side and saw that Nezu had been sitting on the other side this whole time. Izuku? P. Principal Nezu. Nezu. I saw that you met Callum, he entered the assassin order a while ago, and he proved to be very dedicated. His words made Izuku look at Cal, who was walking away from the place. But try not to piss him off. He has a violent history, but he's a nice guy. Izuku. I see. Nezu. I know you're not feeling comfortable here, but believe me, it's better here than being in Tartarus or in the hands of Abstergo. Izuku. If I may ask, sir, is anyone else from UA, besides you, part of this assassin order? Nezu. No, just me. In fact, I'm not exactly one of the assassins, I'm one of their allies. I was indebted to them for saving me, so I let them hide beneath the UA. Only I can access. If they need my help, then I'll do what I can. He said as he looked at the other assassins, where one of them waved at Nezu. Good morning, Rat God said one of the assassins as he passed by them. Izuku. Why do they call you that? He asked. Nezu. I don't know, but I like it. He said with a smile. Anyway, if you need anything, just talk to one of us. He said as he was about to walk away, but, Izuku. Principal Nezu, I wanted to ask you something. His comment made Nezu look at Izuku. Since we're under the UA could I see someone? He asked with embarrassment. Nezu. Wait, do you want to go upstairs to see someone? Izuku. Yes, B, but it's just to let her know I'm fine. Nezu. I don't know, young Midoriya I can't let you compromise the assassin's order for young Yuraka. Izuku. H how did Yuki know I was talking about her? He asked shocked and with a flushed cheek. Nezu. That's not the point. You can't tell her about this place or the existence of assassins, so. Izuku. Wait, wait if you let me see her, I'll enter the animus as many times as necessary. His words made Nezu look surprised at Izuku. I promise I won't tell her anything and that I'll relive Hero's memories so I can help you. I just ask that you let me see her just to say that I'm fine. Nezu. Are you sure this is what you want? Izuku nodded his head. Young love is beautiful, but it's funny. Alright, follow me he said as he walked while Izuku followed him. But I hope you don't go back on your word. Izuku, I don't intend to sir. But if you'll allow me, how do you know I was talking about her? Nezu. I know a lot of things, young man. I know a lot. He said with a mischievous tone as he looked at Izuku, who blushed. But see if it doesn't take too long, okay? Izuku. What do you mean? UA building. Class 1A's classroom. Inside the classroom, everyone remained quiet and serious. 
after Izuku was taken, the class wasn't like before and Izawa could see that, even when he teaches. He noticed that Achako was the most absent-minded and thoughtful. He couldn't blame her, but he knew it couldn't stay like this. Shota. Okay, class, I hope you take this material seriously, because he stopped talking when the door opened. And when they looked to open the door, it was none other than the director of the UA. Nezu. Sorry to miss your class, Shota. Shota. Mr. Nezu. What happened? He asked with his old tired tone, but he was curious. Nezu. Could I take one of your students to talk? He asked while looking at one person. Echako, who was confused. I would like to have a few words with her. Shota. May I know why? Nezu. It's a private matter, but I promise it won't be long. Hearing Nezu's serious tone, Azawa looked at Achako and allowed her to follow the principal, which she did. On the way as they walked through the halls, Achako didn't stop asking. Achako, why did you call me sir? Nezu. You'll find out soon enough, young lady. He said without stopping walking. Achako. Anything new about him? Do you know if he's okay? Is that why you called me? Nezu. I just want you to calm down and come into my room. He said as he opened the door to his room for the girl, who found that strange. Some things will be clarified, just come in there. Hearing that even though she found it strange, Achako obeyed by entering the principal's office, where it had nobody. As she entered and listened to the door close, she suddenly felt a hand touch her shoulder, however. Achako. Gun had immobilization she screamed while the arm of the one who touched her twisted, making the person immobilized and feeling pain. What are you? Izuku. See calm down Achako, it's me it's me. Hearing that voice and seeing who she was twisting Ho's arm, Achako became wide-eyed as she let go of Izuku's arm, who was still feeling a bit of pain. Izuku. My goodness looks like your internship with Gunhead taught you a lot of good things, huh? Haha <laughs> my god, that hurts he said while massaging his arm. Achako. You're here upon hearing that, Izuku looked at the girl and saw that she had tears in her eyes. Are you okay she screamed as she ran and hugged the boy in tears, and upon seeing that, Izuku hugged her back. I I was worried t thinking you were being tortured or worse, she said as she looked at the boy's face, who placed his hands on her cheek. When I saw the news on TV, I I saw you was. Izuku. Relax, that's why I'm here. Not only did I come to let you know that I'm fine, I also came just to see you. He said while looking into Achako's eyes, who was doing the same thing. With their faces close to each other, the inevitable happened. Quickly the two began to kiss, with some sticking their bodies to each other as they melted into that kiss, which carried love, longing and a little thing. And even when they stopped to catch their breath, they quickly went back to kissing more passionately, even more so when Izuku held the brown girl by her legs, well they didn't stop in that wave of making out. Achako. I miss you. She said as she panted and got on top of Izuku, who had his back on Nezu's table. Izuku. Me too. He said while holding Achako's waist with his two hands. Upon feeling Izuku's hands on her waist, Achako started to smile before they felt their mouths connect with each other again with them feeling the urge to go further with it as they were about to take off Izuku's shirt, but before they could think of doing anything, Nezu knocked on the door. Nezu. I must remind you that this is my room, so don't get too excited he said while staying outside, but upon hearing his words, Izuku and Achako blushed as they realized he was right. They would get carried away in the wrong place. Izuku Achako. Sorry, sir he said as they stood up. Nezu. It's okay, but hurry up, please. After hearing that, the couple faced each other with still flushed cheeks. Achako. Eh sorry, I think I overdid it a bit. Izuku. He actually, I also overreacted, so I also apologize he said while rubbing his head. I I missed you. Hearing that, Achako finally remembered what she wanted to ask Izuku. Achako. Wait, if you're here, then that means you. Izuku. Yes, I'm in a safe place close by, but I have to hide there, and unfortunately I can't tell you where I am. Achako. What? But why? Izuku. It's kind of complicated to explain, but let's say those people who took me out of Tartarus don't want to have their locations compromised. However, they know who might have framed me, and they want to help me prove my innocence, he said while holding the girl's hands, who was listening to everything. But, for me to be able to help more so that my innocence is proven, I'll have to do something for them. Achako. Is this something serious? Can I help you? She asked worriedly. Izuku. No, it's not something that serious at least I think so. But, only I can do it. If I want to be able to prove that I'm innocent, then I'll have to do something that can help both them and me. He said in a serious tone. Achako. What are you talking about? Izuku. I sigh I really want to tell you. But I don't want to get you involved in something that has nothing to do with you. He said while caressing the girl's face, who was accepting it willingly. Achako. But isn't there something I can do to help you? Izuku. Just your trusting me is the best help I could ask for. He said with a smile before giving the girl a kiss on the lips, which she returned. Nezu. 
Young Midoriya, we have to go now he said as he stood on the other side of the door. Hearing that, Izuku separated his lips from the girl and asked one more thing, Izuku. In our class, does anyone else besides you believe that I'm innocent? Ichako. Most believe it, but there are some who still doubt it she said disappointed. Do you promise you'll at least be careful? She asked worriedly. Izuku. I promise you, and if I can, I'll try to see you again. He said while he had one of his fingers on the girl's chin, who was smiling at Izuku. Until then, take care and don't tell anyone you saw me, okay? Ichako. I promise she said while hugging Izuku, who returned the hug with affection. However he was serious. On the other side of the door, Nezu was waiting for them before the door opened and the two young people walked out. Nezu. Young Uraka, when you go back to the classroom, don't talk about what happened here. Understood. Achako nodded. Great, you can go. Hearing this, Achako glanced at Izuku one more time before turning around and heading back to the classroom, but as she walked, Izuku and the girl both got a blush on their cheeks as they thought about one thing. Izuku Achako. I love you. End of soundtrack. As soon as they saw the girl out of sight, Nezu and Izuku entered the principal's office, and when he closed the door. Nezu. You already got what you wanted it's time to do your part, young Midoriya. He said in a serious tone as he looked at Izuku, who was staring at the window. We have no more time to waste. Izuku, I'll do my part sir. He said with his fists clenched. Take me to the animus. Hearing that, Nezu and Izuku entered the elevator that was right in Nezu's room. And while the elevator was going down, Nezu noticed that Izuku was more serious than usual. Nezu. Even if you're not doing this by our order, know that you're doing the right thing, young man. Izuku, I hope so sir. When they closed the hideout and walked to the animus room, Izuku and Nezu saw that Rebecca and Sean were inside having coffee. Sean. This coffee came with milk. He noticed that when he took a sip. Rebecca. Stop complaining, this is really good, Nezu. Rebecca, Sean upon hearing their names, the couple turned to the door and saw Izuku and Nezu. Prepare the animus, the boy will help us. Hearing this, the couple quickly turned on the computers and the screen, so they could see everything Izuku saw in the animus. And speaking of him, Izuku was walking over to the machine and when he sat down. William. Did I hear you right? When looking at the door, everyone saw Inko and William had closed, and they were seeing Sean and Rebecca preparing the animus. Is he about to enter the animus? Nezu. Like I said. He's willing to help us. Inko. Son, are you sure about this? She asked worriedly as she stayed beside Izuku, who was in the right position to activate the animus. Izuku. I've made my decision, mom. I want to see where this goes, as nervous as I am about this experience. Sean. It's all on are you ready young man? Izuku breathed a little air through his nostrils, and looking at his mother, who was worried but was respecting Izuku's decision he gave his answer. Izuku. I hope I don't regret this I am ready. Upon hearing Izuku, Rebecca pressed a button that activated the animus, and upon activation Izuku's pupils dilated as he felt his consciousness being taken elsewhere. And when he opened his eyes, Izuku was shocked to see that he was following an eagle soaring through the skies, while everything around the bird was forming and creating the world, but he could tell that it was another century. Rebecca. Midoriya, can you hear us? Izuku. Why yes, I hear you. Rebecca. Great we're watching whatever you're seeing through like right now for example. Izuku. W where am I now? He asked while the eagle flew by on a large hill where there was a fortress full of samurai. Sean. Young man, we're looking at feudal Japan right now. He said while William, Nezu and Inko watched everything on that screen. Alright then, where are you hero? As soon as that eagle passed that fortress, the animus made Izuku approach a man who was on the top of the wall, painting with a black ink what seemed to be a drawing of the mountains that he observed in front of him. This man had black hair tied in a ponytail, a short beard, and he was wearing a red kimono. By being next to that man, Izuku guessed who he might be. Izuku. You must be Hiro. End of soundtrack. Focusing now on Hiro, he was calmly drawing those mountains with a serene look in his eyes, but what he didn't seem to notice was that someone was slowly approaching behind him with one of his hands near the scabbard of his sword. And upon noticing his presence, Hiro turned around and suddenly felt a katana stop near his face, but the man wasn't surprised. I may be getting old, but it seems your ears are going deaf. Careful, Hiro. This could get you killed one day. Said a man who looked to be over 50 years old and was dressed in samurai armor. Hiro. I already knew it was you, Takeda, so I didn't bother to dodge. And as you said yourself. You're getting old. I could hear your footsteps. He said with a slight tone of mockery while Takeda he puts his sword on his waist. Takeda. Careful, boy I'm even more experienced than you. He said with a smirk as he clapped his hand on the side of Hiro's shoulder. What are you doing? Hiro. Drawing, I like to draw. You know, I have an artistic side. He said as he continued to draw. Takeda. If this is art, imagine if it wasn't. He said while looking at Hiro's drawing. 
It wasn't bad, but he wanted to mock anyway. A brush won't help you on the battlefield, hero. Not everything has to be about training or fighting. I've been through that for years. But I believe you didn't come here to talk about my drawings. He said as he continued to draw. Bikita. Straight to the point, huh? Your father wants to see you right now. As he said that, Takeda saw that Hiro stopped moving the brush. And it's important, so don't delay. He's in his usual place it was the only thing he said before walking away from Hiro, who just sighed. A little while later, we see that Hiro was in the center of the fortress where he had a feudal tower. And as he went up the steps and passed some samurai who were greeting Hiro, he finally arrived at the room where his father was waiting for him. And when opening the door, Hiro saw that an old man, who wore the same kimono as Hiro, and who was kneeling in front of what appeared to be his sword and armor. It came sooner than I thought. I expected no less from you. He said as he turned around and looked at Hiro with a smile. Hiro. I try not to disappoint as much as I can. Anyway, may I know why you called me? Upon hearing that question, the man who is said to be Hiro's father stood up and said, let's go out to attack once more. I called you so you could prepare for battle. Hiro. Another one? He asked without being surprised, but he didn't like it. How many times will this go on? We already talked about this, Hiro. Hiro. Yeah, but it looks like the search for this artifact, I don't know what you call it, isn't leading us anywhere. Don't talk like I'm enjoying this it's not my fault our enemies aren't cooperating to accept our treaty he said a little irritated as he looked at Hiro, but soon he calmed down and said. Son, what we are doing now is for a better future. Not only in Japan, but the whole world with this, we can finally prevent more tragedies from happening. We can prevent what happened to you from happening to anyone else. Hiro. And it has to be this way. Why take an artifact we don't know how to control? It's to make us powerful, my son. With this, no one will dare to threaten or challenge us. That's why we need this. And that's why I need you. He said as he put his hand on Hiro's shoulder. I can count on you, Hiro. Hiro just nodded. I knew you wouldn't let me down. Get your equipments, we're leaving soon. Hearing that, Hiro was about to leave the room, but. Hiro may the father of understanding guide us. He said with determination. Hiro. May the father of understanding guide us. He said despondently before leaving the room. In the present, those watching were shocked by what they heard. Sean. You're kidding me, Izuku. What happened? Rebecca. Hiro was a Templar, Izuku. What? How do you know that? He asked in shock when he heard this information, he looked at Hiro, who entered what seemed to be his room. Rebecca. What they just said is a phrase only Templars say. Father of understanding. Izuku. B but Hiro, wasn't that one of the assassins? Nezu. This is getting more and more interesting. He said while looking at the screen, where everyone saw what Izuku was seeing, which in this case was Hiro picking up his katana and looking at his reflection on the blade, where the man showed his gaze. Izuku. What happened to you, Hiro? He asked curious and worried about the direction this would take, as he looked at Hiro's reflection in the sword. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.